above the Diamantina. A human story from Northwest Queensland. As a result of Detective Bonaparte's investigations and subsequent information from Sergeant Cox, he has established the route taken by the unknown man who stole the aeroplane from Golden Dawn. Dr. Stanisforth, the Brisbane specialist, is unable to diagnose the mysterious girl's paralysed condition, and Boney has sent a telegram to the Commissioner of Police requesting him to send Illa Wally, an Aboriginal chieftain, to Coolibar in the hope that he may succeed where the white doctors have failed. We now find Sergeant Cox and Boney in the lounge of the Cooley Bar homestead. This paper may interest you, Boney. I've jotted down a few facts about various people living in the district. Splendid. Let me see, Sergeant. There you are. Thanks. Now, John Nettlefold, part owner of Cooley Bar Station, holds 55% of the shares in it. Hmm. Ted Shop. Came from pastoral district down on the Warika. Antecedents unknown. In 1928 inherited 3,500 pounds on the death of an uncle. It's very interesting. Now, Sergeant, can you tell me this? If Ted Sharp inherited 3,500 pounds, why should he have remained at Coolabar as a stockman? I haven't the faintest idea, Boney. It's a complete mystery to me. Yeah. Well, Dr. Knowles now... Born in Sussex, England, friend of John Kane, first came to live in Golden Dawn in 1919, good record in the Royal Air Force during the Great War, spends on an average of £32 per month on drink. Mm. Hmm, a queer fellow, this knows, isn't he? Yeah, but he's honest enough. A very likable chap. Now, uh, what is your personal opinion of Ted Sharp? Oh, I like him, too. He keeps very much to himself. He was very friendly until quite recently with Owen Oliver. Indeed? Yes, it's rather peculiar. They're such a completely different type. Now, I wouldn't have thought they'd have a single thing in common. Sergeant, uh, do you think the postmaster would give you a copy of a certain telegram which was dispatched from his office early on the morning of October the 28th? Oh, I don't know. He might. You realize, Sergeant, we have entered upon a race with death. Yes, I know. Dr. Stennisforth gave the girl less than two months to live, didn't he? Perhaps you could point out that fact to the postmaster. Oh, I think he'll do it. He's a very decent fellow. Uh, what telegram is it? It is one which Ted Sharp sent from Garner's Hotel. He telephoned it to the post office on the night the aeroplane was stolen. How did you find that out? Garner told me about it himself. Hmm. That fellow Garner doesn't miss much. Did he hear what Ted Sharp said on the phone? Only a word here and there, but it was enough to make me interested. Extremely interested. It's funny that Gurner never mentioned that telegram to me. I went out there, you know, a day or so after the theft. Yes, he gave me the impression that he was not very comfortable in the presence of the police. Rather shifty eyes, I thought. What do you know of him? Oh, he's been the licensee of the hotel for 41 years. He married in... And uh, just a moment, I've got a note of it here. Yes, here it is. Married in 1899. His wife died last year. Now, he employs an Aboriginal as groom and a half-caste maid. And his sister is the cook and housekeeper. Yes, he told me that himself. What character has the black? Jack Johnson. <laughs> Neither good nor bad. And the maid? Well, she's about 23, I believe. And uh, Miss Gurner? Oh, decent old sort and a good cook. Although she's almost blind and very hard of hearing. Well, that's helpful. What about Gurner himself? Well, I've never had any trouble with him. He and his sister run the place all right. Gurner drinks a bit, and he's never made a fortune out of the place. But he must make a pretty good living, as he runs a car and all that kind of thing. I should say he mixed well with his customers. Oh, yes. He's a poll clerk on election days, amongst other things. Yeah, you know, quite the big man of his own particular world. Yes. Uh, is there any police supervision there? Constable Lovett runs out there once a week, so. 
There's never any trouble there, if that's what you mean. Sergeant, I want you to go out there and make a few inquiries. Say you are after a car that was reported stolen from Winton and was seen uh, heading west. All right. But do you mind telling me why? Of course not. I want to know what traffic passed the hotel during the night the aeroplane was stolen. Also, the following night. All right, I'll do that, Bernie. I see you have a small report about Burl Saunders, the girl at the telephone exchange. Now, uh, who exactly is Burl Saunders? Oh, she's the daughter of Saunders the Butcher. Her brother, by the way, is the night operator at the telephone exchange. The exchange is in the family, apparently. Uh, Sergeant, information uh, seems to leak out very quickly in Golden Dawn. And I have an idea the telephone exchange is responsible. Yes, yeah, a very serious matter, Bernie. Certainly. Now, one other thing. Will you telegraph headquarters and ask them to check up on all importers and manufacturers of explosives? I want to find out if any nitroglycerine has been delivered to anyone in this district. All right, I will. But what's the idea? Mr. Cartwright, the fire insurance assessor, told me that Loveacre's aeroplane was destroyed by nitroglycerine. Good heavens. I thought it was set on fire. Fire would have been sufficient, Sergeant. But fire is an uncertain agent. The man who stole the aeroplane evidently wanted to be certain that the aeroplane would be destroyed when it crashed. So he placed a canister of nitroglycerine in the machine. It was only by a stroke of fortune that the girl was not blown to smithereens. What a swine. I agree with your definition. We must bring that man to justice, Sergeant. Now, did you send that telegram to the commissioner? Yes, I rang up Constable Lovett and he sent the message immediately. Excellent. My only hope is that they'll find Illawali soon. He may be away on walkabout. I have great faith in that man, Sergeant. Yeah, well, let's hope he can do something. Well, if you'll excuse me, I must go downstairs. I have a few more questions to ask, and I particularly want to see Dr. No. Mr. Littlefold, aren't you a member of the Apollo Club in Brisbane? Yes, Dr. Sanderson. Don't get much time to visit Brisbane these days, though. I thought I saw your name on the register. Will you have another drink? No, not for the moment, thanks. I wonder if you know Henry Beesdale. Beesdale? Oh, yes, very well indeed. Uh, how is your patient tonight, Miss Elizabeth? Oh, just the same, I'm afraid, Bernie. Now that Dr. Knowles is in the house, I leave her as much as I can to him. Yes, I wish I could do more. It's the most puzzling case I've ever come across. I think I should go upstairs now and relieve Hetty for a while. Will you excuse me? Oh, it's a bit certain. Oh, but of course. I'll come up and see her later on. Now, Dr. Samuel and I are going to take a stroll on the garden. Can you blue two look after yourselves for a while? Yes, oh, I think so, Mr. Lenny Help yourself to a drink if you want one of those. No, thanks. Uh, I would like to have a talk with you, Mr. Nettlefold, uh, later on. Certainly. You know where to find me. All right. Now, Dr. Knowles, how about a drink? And everyone else seems to have deserted us. Oh, well, it's not a bad idea, I suppose, though, as a matter of fact, I'm trying to cut down on them. Oh? Why? Well... Well, a man must draw the line somewhere. Oh, well, water. Please. No. Thanks. I suppose this case is taking a pretty big bite out of your time. Yes, it is. It's an extremely interesting case. Yes, I'm finding it so, too. I'm thinking of throwing up my other work so I can devote all my time to this girl. But uh, what about the rest of your cases? How will they get along? Well, I haven't any at the moment. Uh, none of them serious, anyway. Oh, uh, are you anywhere nearer finding the devil who drugged the girl upstairs yet? Yes and no. Of course, I know it is the usual thing for a detective to say he has an important clue. That is the usual saying when he is completely baffled. But I do not mind admitting that I am baffled up to the present moment as far as the man's identity is concerned. Well, that's honest enough anyway. However, I am getting warm. I know much more than I did when I came here. I know more than I did a, a day ago, more than I did an hour ago, for that matter. <laughs> really, really, quite a paragon of detectives. Do you know that I have never yet failed to finalize a case? No, I didn't. Well, you see, I have a reputation to keep up. The secret of my success, Doctor, is because I did not graduate from a policeman's beat, because I did not allow red tape to control, and also because I never overlook any apparently trivial side issues. Well, we've something in common there, Bernie. Yes. These side issues may have no connection whatever with the major mystery, and yet it never does to overlook them. Very often, too, they form the very keystone of the arch which supports the major mystery. Indeed. 
I don't know quite what you're referring to at the moment, but uh, perhaps I can help you to clear up some of these side issues. You can, Dr. Knowles, but I'm rather afraid to put the desired question to you for fear of straining our present friendly relations. Good heavens, why? Well, you see, it concerns yourself. Well, I fail to see how I can help you. I do not say that you can, Doctor, but your case interests me very much. Probably I can dispose of my doubts in one or two questions. Very well. What are they? Please do not think that what I am about to ask you is actuated by idle curiosity. But why have you suddenly decided to fight your craving for drink? I don't see that as any of your business. I quite agree, my dear doctor. I was afraid you might take that attitude. I have no wish to offend you. Therefore, we might as well drop the subject. Oh, well, I... I may as well tell you, I... I admit I am trying to cut down on the whiskey. It's... It's not an easy story to tell. Well, please take your time, Doctor. Well, it begins at the time when I was doing my third year of medicine. That was in 1915. I was very, very much in love with a girl of my own age, and one night when I was taking her back to her home in Ealing, that's in London, you know, we were caught in an air raid. A bomb dropped quite near us, and a splinter of it struck her in the head. It killed her outright. She was in my arms, Boney, when she died, and... I've never forgotten it. Never. That is terrible. I don't know how I ever recovered from that experience. I joined the Air Force soon after, and I really didn't care at the time whether I was killed or not. Or... But fate, for some obscure reason of her own, looked after me. And that's when I first took to drink, Bernie. I think I understand. I don't know why I never killed myself. I, I thought about it often enough. I suppose I hadn't the courage. Then, after the war, you took up medicine again? Yes, but I've never really taken it seriously. I've never taken anything really seriously since then. After that night in 1915, until last week. Then why have you suddenly changed your attitude? Well, you probably won't believe me, Boney, but this girl upstairs is the exact double of the girl I lost during the war. Thank you.